BL Central Division Speaker Series, where we invite conversations that incorporate the richness of the regions that we serve in furtherance of ADL's mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. ADL has recognized the incredible power of corporate voice in standing up to hate. Our incredibly successful Stop Hate for Profit campaign galvanized more than 1,100 businesses in the summer of 2020 to send a clear message to Facebook with an ad pause. Businesses communicated so clearly that a social media giant needed to stop valuing profits over hate, bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism, and disinformation. Earlier this year, as I stood outside Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, as the hostage situation unfolded, I was overwhelmed with the outpouring of support that the ADL family received from so many community leaders, faith leaders, civic leaders, and corporate leaders. Today, we have the opportunity to dive into a discussion with three incredible thought leaders who are working every day to drive authentic corporate activism. I am thrilled to introduce our panelists who are going to share the pitfalls and successes of corporate activism through their incredibly knowledgeable lenses. In no particular order, because they are all amazing, I want to welcome Nia Mathis. Nia is Region Vice President for State and Local Government Affairs at Verizon, where she is responsible for shaping policy in 22 states across the Midwest and New England in support of Verizon's objectives. She is passionate about positive cultural change, cross-functional collaboration, courageous action, and sustainable outcomes. Joining us is Kazike Prince, who is the Global Director for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at NI, which is formerly known as National Instruments. Kazike is responsible for developing and implementing comprehensive workforce DEIB programs, including setting the strategy, program goals, and metrics to drive the outcomes through communications, education, and leadership actions. And Sandra Phillips Rogers, Sandra is Group Vice President and Chief Legal Officer of Toyota North America, where she manages the legal efforts for the operations, and at the same time, she's the Chief Diversity Officer, where she stewards Toyota's long-standing commitment to advancing diversity and inclusion in the workplace, in the marketplace, and in society, with an emphasis on driving ESG best practices. I am thrilled to get to have this conversation with all of you, and I am going to throw a, com a, a conversation starter out to everyone, um, you all could be doing a lot of amazing things. Your resumes, which I only glanced over in my introductions of you, are impressive. So what is driving you to do your work in this area? And we'll start with Sandra. So thank you, Cheryl, and, and hello to the audience. Uh, uh, I think this is a very important and timely topic, and I'm so glad that you took the time to support it. Uh, you know, what, what, what drives me is a constant quest for continuous improvement. Uh, Toyota, our core values are really around that which is also known in Japanese as Kaizen, but also respect for people. And because I believe that so intently, uh, I guess I'm never satisfied with the status quo. I'm always trying to challenge it. I'm always trying to find ways to make sure that our team members at Toyota, as well as those in the communities where we live and work, really do have limitless possibilities and, and equal opportunities to, to really, you know, reach their highest potential. You know, I think that this is really what the opportunity is that corporate America has. How can they create an ecosystem uh, within their four walls and, and outside of it in their communities so that everyone can have an opportunity to really reach their potential. This is how I think as a company, we succeed. Uh, this is how as a community, we succeed. I really truly believe that this is the answer to a lot of things that plague society today is that there are 
groups of people, individuals who feel like they're not being included, who may feel like they're not, their voices are not being heard. And so uh, what's important to me is, is that we find a way to engage our team members so they bring their full selves to work. And that inspires me. But then also, how can our team members then connect up with our community and our community partners, our business partners, our dealers, our suppliers, and also our customers. And so in that kind of ecosystem with the team member being the hub and everything else being the spoke that goes out of it, I think that's when great things can happen. That's when innovation can happen. And that's what we need as we transform into a society of mobility for all. And so this is kind of what gets me going uh, every day. I feel like this is incredibly purposeful work of the highest calling. And I'm just so pleased and humbled to be one of the leaders at Toyota whose job it is, is to keep all of this going to make progress so that we have the workplace that, that we desire and live in the communities that are thriving and vibrant. Thank you, Sandra. Um, in my day job, I count hate all the time. In fact, it's kind of a growth industry. In the last couple of years, we have seen numbers surge against the AAPI community during the pandemic. Um, ADL's focus on anti-Semitism and our anti-Semitic audit, audit, we know that anti-Semitic incidents are only on the rise. Um, post George Floyd, our nation has had a conversation, um, a much necessary conversation and a very delayed conversation about race and what that means. And so Nia, and I guess I'm asking you the same question I asked Sandra, but when we're talking about bending the arc of the moral universe towards justice, I'm often reminded it takes a lot of people pushing, lots of people pushing all the time. Tell me about, tell me about why you're doing this incredible work. Yeah, so just like Sandra, I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you here today and to talk about uh, Verizon's um, place in this as a corporation in, in the fight toward uh, and for social justice. So let me set the stage for some of what I will talk about in terms of our internal and external value alignments. Our CEO, Hans Vesper, took the helm in 2018, and we embarked on a journey to what we call Verizon 2.0. So under his leadership, we reoriented our corporate strategy to focus on four stakeholders, the first three stakeholders are the typical ones you'd expect, our customers, right? Making sure we understand who our customers are and make sure that our technology products and services meet their needs. The second stakeholder is employees, right? Making sure that we create an environment that unleashes, as Sandra said, the full potential of each employee. The third group is our shareholders. We have to deliver results and a return on the investment they make in our company. But our CEO added a new stakeholder that radically changed our strategic approach and that fourth stakeholder is society. That means that in addition to thinking about how our company serves our customers, our employees, and our shareholders, we get to the privilege of considering how we impact society. So now our corporate strategy incorporates plans to address some of society's biggest challenges like climate change, the digital divide, and diversity in technology. And when we engage in corporate philanthropy, we do so with a strategic purpose, understanding that solving large societal challenges will benefit Verizon in the long run. So in support of that and in that framework of thinking, in July 2020, we launched Citizen Verizon, and that's our responsible business plan for economic, environmental, and social advancement. So the Citizen Verizon program includes education programs, digital resources for small businesses, technology employment training, an extensive volunteer program for employees within their local communities and ongoing climate initiatives as well. So as part of Citizen Verizon, we've made significant commitments, including providing 10 million youth with digital skills training and 1 million small businesses with resources to help them succeed in the digital economy by the year 2030. 
in the area of climate protection, we're committed to achieving net zero emissions in our operations by 2035. And in human prosperity, we will prepare 500,000 individuals for jobs of the future by 2030 through skills training resources. And so every Verizon employee or V-teamer as we like to call ourselves has an opportunity to support our commitment to 2.5 million volunteer hours by 2025. So Verizon was on this journey before the murder of George Floyd sent shockwaves across our nation. Verizon was already walking the path when we had a broader societal awakening, but I'll never forget when our CEO, Hans Vestberg, delivered an emotional message to all 130,000 Verizon employees, assuring the Black employees that we mattered, telling us that he wanted to listen to and understand our stories, and announcing a $10 million donation to racial justice charities. So the way we responded, we responded as a company was really of the moment, truly as V-teamers and all members of our society and company reflected that with genuine uh, compassion. And that's what drives our work in this area. Thank you, Nia. And I promised I was going to ask everybody because I think all of your stories are so incredibly interesting. Um, Kazike, what drives you to do this? Um, if you bear with me, one, I want to say thank you for um, inviting me to be here today. It's a really be a joy to share and learn from uh, other esteemed panelists here today. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna push mine a little bit more on a personal level. Um, the reason why I do this work, why I'm so committed to it. Um, I remember hearing a story from my grandfather from back in the day. Now he's a veteran, his father was actually a veteran as well. And when he had came back from serving over during uh, World War II, an uh, incident arose in the town that he lived in in West Texas. An incident had to do with some other person, another African-American in the community. But as a result, the town um, people went around uh, his town looking for someone, anyone who was black and uh, basically was going to hurt them, if not kill them. And his only way of uh, having that experience go over him, or for the bypass, I should say, was to hide in the cemetery. And he hid there for three days because over those three days, they were killing people left and right in his town. Uh, they didn't kill him, they beat him up. And he tells me that story and, and he tells about his experience over in, fighting in Germany. I listened to my great grandfather talk about his experiences during World War I. And it was just, these are intelligent, brilliant men who, good, who got to stand up maybe in their own communities, but when they were outside their own communities, uh, they had to shuffle and, sh and jive to get by, uh, to uh, be threatened of their life on a regular basis because of, because of uh, who they are and their skin color. And so when I think about my kids' experience, I want a world where they don't have to worry about those kinds of experiences. They don't have to hide in the cemetery because a group of people are coming after them uh, because they're black for no other reason. And so I want a world where my kids and other people's kids, uh, myself included, can live in a world and not let my race be somehow a negative, but if anything seen as a powerful, a wonderful gift uh, that I was given and as others were given and have that honored in a allow me to be authentic in how I show up every day. Uh, and unfortunately, my grandfather and my great-grandfather and great-grandmother and others, they never had that experience of being able to show up and be themselves and be authentic. And so I want the opportunity for myself and for my children and people I love and care about here and my organization and other places to be able to stand up and be unapologetically who they are. And that's what motivates me. Kazike. Thank you for sharing something so personal and meaningful. I wanna probe a little harder because what you say is, it's so impactful. And I guess a concern um, that, that I think people have in, the air, in this area is how do we make sure that DEI work is really sustainable? Not that it's just reactive, not that it's just a flashpoint and it was a good idea, so everybody's gonna do some of it. Um, we know that some of companies' initiatives are relatively new. Um, what will sustain this kind of work in a meaningful way beyond a short-term investment? Um, I, one, I'm really glad that uh, uh, 
uh, other panelists or speak, spoke earlier because I really I think they highlighted some important pieces for an initiative like this to be a long-term investment. Uh, one, uh, this is not something that you check the box off and then you're done after a few years. And I get that still to this day. So, so I guess we'll do this for a few years and then we'll move on to something else. No, <laughs> being very straightforward and saying this is a long-term, this is a part, part of the DNA, the groundwater of this organization. This is something we're investing in as if we were building a brand new building. You know, you hear about organizations putting billions of dollars into buildings. Well, look, about, look at the resources that are necessary to make that building come to fruition. And so when I talk to organizations, they ask me, how much money investment are we talking about? I say, oh, yeah, a good estimate to start is about 1% of your profits. So if you think about 1% of your profits, long-term in, in investment, I'm like, I'm here trying to build a building. I'm trying to change the culture of the organization then that's, it changes the expectations people have about what these types of initiatives are about. Uh, it means I need to have professionals with expertise. And if you don't have the professionals expertise, you have consultants. And if you don't have that, you get people on your team to get trained up and be familiar. But even more important is having leadership on board. Uh, this is something that's solely a, a grassroots effort of concerned employees. It's, it's nice that, don't get me wrong, you need that. But you need to have leadership on board who take charge, who take a stand, who are willing to you know, take, take the brunt of some of the, uh, the negativity that may result because people speak up. They're, they're the ones who are gonna shield their employees from the negativity that some of us experience in this space. And so hence, in, in my previous life, I was an um, advisor to uh, Mayor Adler here in the city of Austin. There were some things that he could say that I could not. And that was just the world we live in. But he was able to speak to certain people to convince them. And so having those champions, those voices, having that infrastructure, having resources, expertise, those are all the things that will help to maintain a long, the long life of an initiative like this uh, for the life of the organization as it, as it, and, and actually hopefully change it over a period of time. So they're not the same organization they were in the past. And those are just a few of the things, but those are places I would start to make sure this is a long-term uh, effort versus a short term. Thank you, Kazike. Really, really insightful on, on sustainability there. Sandra, something that we've talked about before and that, that you mentioned in your opening about the various audiences, the various places um, where you're doing your leading internally for employees, externally for the community. Um, you've shared with me before about the importance of employee trust. Um, and the relationship that an, the employee has with the employer, particularly in areas for leadership and guidance. Will you, will you talk a little more about how corporations can model actions internally for an, employees at the same time they're externally modeling for the broader community? You, you know, Cheryl, I, I think first and foremost, uh, companies really have a huge role to play just within the ecosystem of their four walls, and that's their team members. Uh, their, their, their greatest asset, their greatest strategic advantage, uh, the very heart and soul of the company. And so I think if you get that right, you're, you're, you're really on your way to, to, to even greater things. You know, there's a, uh, Edelman does a trust barometer and and around the time of all of the civil, uh, the social, uh, uh, you know, injustice, unrest of the 2020, you know, we took a look at that uh, survey just to kind of check to see what's going on in corporate America. And, you know, I must say, I was a little surprised when I looked at it. You know, 76% of those who were polled say that they believe their employer is kind of the mainstay of trust. And, and you know, 56% said that businesses are like the most trusted institution. This is beyond government and perhaps uh, media, uh, you know, even, even various leaders in the community. And what that told me is, is that employees are looking are watching and expecting 
certain behaviors from companies, but that they trust companies to do the right thing. And so that really gave uh, our efforts at Toyota a lot of lift because it, what it said is, is that, you know, what we set out to do, we actually might be successful in terms of, of, of demonstrating to our employees our commitment and how we're including their voices to make positive change. You know, like Nia said, it taught us down a journey for a number of years, but I don't think there's any question that 2020 really required something in addition to what was being done previously. And so the internal external play that you mentioned, Cheryl, really came about in the creation of a social justice advocacy committee. You know, before the tragic events, at least the ones that were widely reported, because we know there are many tragic events uh, that have happened in the history of this co of country against many groups of, of people. But prior to the murder of George Floyd, we had already established a social justice committee that would help give guidance to the company on how to respond in, in, in some of these issues that, you know, moved outside of the walls of our company, or frankly, that may have come in from the outside. And, and, and what we did is we, we tried to come up with an approach that would engage and involve our team members first and foremost, but then empower them to move out into the community to make positive change. And so it was like a five-point approach. First of all, we focused on education. You know, we had to listen to our team members. We had to hear the concerns and understand where the opportunities and perhaps some of the gaps were. Um, and you know that showed empathy, which is one of our cultural priorities uh, of our global company. And then from there, you know, the education was speaker series and having difficult conversations around race and and in ways that we really hadn't done before. And so, you know, the point of sustainability is the good news, that's still going. And I don't think punto de sustainability todavía está y no va a parar porque llega al awareness um, that everyone saw the benefit of that. You know, then we move into what can we advocate for? You know, can we, you know, try to help uh, 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 some of our community organizations work with our, our, our police on active bystander training? And so that's the way we kind of mix the internal and with the external because our team members very much wanted to be a part of the solution. And so through that training, we were able to do that. Of course, we made more investments and doubled down in places where we thought those dollars could be put to best use to help advance the good work of organizations like ADL that already well invested and have made tremendous progress over the years. But the, the fourth element was we wanted to connect with our business partners, again, external to Toyota, but very much a part of the Toyota family. And so we partnered with our dealers, our suppliers. They gave us ideas of what they thought we needed to be focused on and thinking about in the moment. And we found that to be extremely helpful because again, you know, it, it's a two-way street. You know, we're giving them great ideas they're sharing ideas with us. And then last, but probably most important, it's the team member engagement. What can we do to show our team members that uh, our commitment to diversity and inclusion and equity uh, uh, not only is something that's in the sky that you're trying to grasp, but it's something right in front of you. And as a team member, you see it and appreciate it every day in terms of how you show up to work. So, so these are the ways in which I think we, we kind of navigated the internal and external. But I think when it comes to external, the big learning is this. Actions do speak ultimately louder than words. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, when the, the terrible attacks in the Asian American Pacific Islander community really kind of reached uh, a, a bit of a crescendo that we weren't, you know, just 
talking about it from a hashtag standpoint, but that we were making some meaningful progress inside of our company and outside. At the end of the day, I think the companies that have maybe done well, I, I think all companies have advanced this issue in some way. And so I wouldn't be critical of any company, but I think the companies where sustainability has a better chance is where they have stayed focused on the North Store of their, of their culture. And so I think it's important that in any organization, it's just like a family, you know, the family kind of has its rhythm and they do best when they're in rhythm. And I think companies do best when they are in rhythm, lockstep with their own values. And so I think that that's the message that I would leave on the question that you asked, Cheryl, is, you know, how can you uh, navigate these turbulent, uh, you know, highly polarized times? I think it's sticking close to your cultural values and letting your actions speak. Thank you, Sandra. Um, that consistency between words and actions is so incredibly um, tremendous. You know, when I was doing my homework for this conversation, clearly um, we invited all of you because of who you are and the change making that you're leading. Um, but Nia, I have to say some of the partnership work that Verizon is doing to me is just blow away. I think we all know that we need to move past cute quotes and hashtags and billboards and, you know, face filter uh, or, or even taking out ads just to say this is who we are. Um, you have some really great examples that I'm just asking you to, to, to share with us in ways that Verizon's partnered with communities that driving change. So I'm pleased, pleased to answer that question. And uh, I'm hearing a lot of similar themes across our, our companies from different perspectives. And uh, it just feels great to know that, you know, we're, we're charting this course together. But as a company, we've been giving back to communities for years, but often working with large, well-known nonprofits in various ways. But more recently, starting around 2018, we began engaging with community groups at the local grassroots level. And as we've heard, local engagement is a long-term effort. It requires a real commitment at the front end and throughout, but at the front end, we spent hours doing groundwork research, gaining an understanding of the key organizations and neighborhoods in our cities across the country, and listening to small nonprofits, activists, and other community leaders, really listening to understand. And that front end effort helped us to begin, just to begin to appreciate what makes a community tick and what resources Verizon can bring to the table. So we've found that partnering with smaller groups and providing assistance that goes beyond a monetary donation can have a huge impact and create benefits for everyone. Thought leadership is a huge way that we give back to these local organizations, looking at what their uh, goals are and, and how they uh, uh, you know, intend to accomplish that and how we can bring thought leadership to help them be more effective uh, in their missions. And volunteerism, you know, we have employees all across the country. How can we bring our hands and feet and hearts and minds and into these local organizations to support their mission um, and, and support what they're doing, the important work they're doing in the community. And so those are key elements of our hands-on local engagement strategy. And our employees have stepped up in remarkable ways. Last year, we gave more than 500,000 hours of personal time by our employees to support their communities toward our 2.5 million hour uh, volunteer goal. So in Colorado, I'll speak specifically, I can, I can pick on any state and sort of zoom in, um, but in Colorado, Verizon's community engagement program has enabled us to connect with over two dozen external community partners focusing on STEM education, LGBTQ equality, social and racial justice, veterans, business advocacy. So I'm proud to specifically call out some of our external partners and their work that we support across our key focus pillars of digital inclusion, human prosperity and climate protection. So we were proud to support the ADL's No Place for Hate anti-bullying campaign, which is operating in over 80 schools across Colorado. 
We supported AMP the Cause to benefit low-income families in the Denver metro area. Conservation Colorado, they had a 30 by 30 campaign to protect water and natural lands in the state. The list continues all meaningful, exciting work. We sponsored the Colorado State University Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, last year, Denver's Pride Fest, and we were the first corporate sponsor ever of Denver's Juneteenth, Juneteenth Music Festival. We supported One Colorado's Trans Education Program, Servicios de la Raza to support the Latino community, Special Olympics Colorado, Urban Leadership Foundation. We supported their 2021 class to train future Black leaders in business and civic uh, leadership. And we're supporting similar programs like all across the country. So here in Chicagoland, where I sit, we founded a marquee program to provide seed funding and ecosystem support to early stage tech founders in the black and brown communities. So these are but a few examples of the partnerships we're investing in, um, really micro local across the country. And so this hands on local involvement in these projects has really yielded closer relationships and more trust, as Sandra talked about, that importance of trust between Verizon, who many people associated with the TV commercials and the Verizon store. Um, but now here are you know, people that are showing up in our communities representing our values, uh, our core values, and, and society and serving society is a big part of that. So we still have a lot to learn. We still have a lot of work to do, but one thing is for sure, we're all better off when we work together to make sure that our communities at the local level are stronger. They said, Nia, yeah, just such incredible work and the, the thought that goes into selecting those partners and making sure that you are connected to the communities you serve is tremendous. I. I'm going to take personal privilege here because having the three of you in conversation is such an opportunity. Um, I don't think that I bring on board a new team member or even receive a, a resume or cover letter these days that doesn't toss the word inclusion somewhere in, into their wording. And um, diversity, equity, inclusion, I knew in Kazike's uh, title, there's belonging. Um, but I really want to talk about defining inclusion because I find when I get into conversation with people that it has a variety of meanings. And so I really want to talk to you from, from your seats. Um, what does true inclusion, actual authentic inclusion mean? And Kazike, I'll start with you and run around the table. Well, great. Um, hope I don't oversimplify this because it is a pretty nuanced, complicated idea, but inclusion really is about um, getting the mix that you have represented in your organization and having them work together well. But to do that, that means you have to have systems in place. You have to have policies, programs, a network of things in place to make sure that that mix comes together well. Not particularly when things Things are just well, going well and everyone loves each other, but particularly when things are difficult and challenging, because a lot of the challenges we see when we're trying to build a, a, a culture of inclusion is oftentimes the disagreements that we see across teams or people individually is oftentimes cultural differences that are manifesting in disagreements about a subject matter when it's actually oftentimes differences of, of, of style, cultural uh, understandings, uh, awareness about certain issues. And if you get people to better understand themselves culturally, but also the people that they work with and create those bridges across teams and individuals, that's where you can build that inclusive uh, 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 environment. But I guess I wanna make cl be clear, this is more than just individuals you know, trying to do the right thing and, and work together. You have to have systems in place that encourage the behaviors that you're looking for. And so it's all those different pieces that really is getting that mix to work together well. And if you can do that, um, you can come closer and closer to building that community or culture of, of inclusion. I don't think you oversimplified, Kazike. I think you gave us some really great context. So thank you. Sandra, what about you? Uh, inclusion, what does it really mean? So, so I think inclusion is, maybe two elements to it, what's visible and what is not. The, the visible aspect of it is when you look around a room and you're trying to solve a problem, you know, 
do you have all of the voices that you need at the table? Uh, have you included different perspectives? Or if it's a department, have you included the sales department? Have you included manufacturing? Have you included a woman, a person of color? You know, that's what I think is visible. Um, I think it's an environment where all perspectives and voices are considered. But it's that, that not visible piece that, that I think is, is so important. It's the feeling that people have that they're being a part of a process, that their voices are being heard, that their perspectives are being heard. And so when you have an environment of inclusion, I think people feel like they can really participate, bring their full selves to work. Uh, if they've got spiked hair or, or something that is personal to them, but very important, that they can still come into a room and, and be a part of the conversation and feel welcome and feel safe. I think safety is a critical component of inclusion. Do you feel uh, uh, safe when you speak up? You know, will your voice actually be solicited? And so that's the part of it that I like to focus on. How do team members feel? Do they feel like they're in an environment where they're cared for, where they're valued, where the voices are being heard. But then I think the other aspect of it is just, you know, have you as a leader uh, or a team leader, have you included all of the viewpoints that you need in order to make the best decision? And, and I can tell you, a company like Toyota that's got, you know, almost 40,000 team members you know, in all over the country, in rural America, in urban America, there's going to be different takes and different perspectives, even on issues where you would think maybe everyone should roughly be in alignment. That's the environment that I think we're living in right now. Everything seems to kind of have two sides to it. That's not a bad thing. But it is something that you have to navigate. And so as you are moving towards your North Star of respect for people, you've got to remember to include voices that might actually be on the other side of an issue. It doesn't necessarily mean that that side, if it's not aligned with core values, predominates. But what it does mean is that you've given all of those voices a chance to be heard and considered, and I think at the end of the day, that's what most people want. They, they just want to be heard. They want to know that you see them. And so if you can create an environment where you can get those things right, or at least try your best to get them right, then I think you've succeeded. Good advice as always, Sandra. Nia? hard to go third on this question. So I apologize in advance for you having to do it, but, but what can you add to helping people understand what true inclusion really means? Yeah, so as we've heard, inclusion is about fostering an equitable, equitable environment where employees can bring their authentic, that authentic whole self, right, to work. So in these times when some forces in society would have us focus on division, we choose to focus on celebrating our cultural differences and our harmonizing commonalities across the spectrum of race, religion, gender identity, disability or veteran status, age, and all of that together is what strengthens our company and our culture. So we're a big company, but we've managed to keep social justice and racial equity as part of our employee dialogue in keeping with the experiences in our nation at large. So we're continuously working to create an equitable environment where employees can bring their whole self to work. And we do this in several ways. One important uh, way is, is we've created safe spaces in both large and small group settings for discussions, 
for Black employees, for employees of all backgrounds, for instance, to discuss the impact that we all felt um, with George Floyd. But we carry that forward, right? It's not a then and done. We're carrying that forward and creating spaces to hear from and support our brothers and sisters in the AAPI community to combat the rise in anti-Asian hate. Early on, Verizon published a racial and social justice action toolkit. It's available to the public on verizon.com to help people get educated on social and racial disparities and learn how to evolve from an advocate to an ally in supporting communities of color in our country. Verizon provides targeted development opportunities for employees of color to support them in their career growth. And we support 10 ERGs, employee resource groups. We don't just have them sitting on the side and they're doing a meeting and no one really knows and it's in the, in the dark corner, but we bring them in to foster inclusive practices across the company. And we integrate those ERGs into the business with a focus on career advancement, customer focus, community focus and cultural focus and a celebration that all employees can enjoy. So we all know we're in a much more complex world where all of these intersectionalities matter. And the more empathetic we can be, the more we can treat people with humanity and build bridges of connection, the better our overall outcomes will be. That's the internal side. But when I think about ex inclusion externally, we at Verizon are guided by our mission. We create the networks that move the world forward for everyone. No one should be left behind in this digital and technological revolution to a 5G economy. So Verizon is committed to helping ensure that all Americans have access to affordable, reliable broadband and that they're equipped with the appropriate skills to use that technology and the access. We're committed to value conscious customers as evidenced by our low cost wireless service offering through TrackPhone. So we recently acquired TrackPhone that makes us the largest provider of prepaid wireless in the United States with more than 21 million customers. And we're committed to maintaining and improving upon TrackPhone's excellent record of Lifeline wireless service. And as you may know, Lifeline is the FCC's program to help make communication services more affordable for low income customers. And in addition to supporting, acquiring and supporting a lifeline through TrackPhone, um, with our other Verizon services as well, we participate in the federal affordable connectivity program. That's where low income customers as qualified by the federal government can receive discounts of up to $30 a month, a month to apply to all their mobile and home internet plans. And so, you know, further as our federal, state, and local governments right now are working with private industry to figure out how to utilize these stimulus funds to address digital equity, Verizon supports those efforts. And we're looking for opportunities to partner with, with our local, state, and federal government to support the American goal of broadband for all. And finally, as we've talked about with community engagement, we continue to identify and support local organizations, those organizations that have earned the trust in our local communities to develop programs and teach people how to use this technology, how to adopt it and get the most out of uh, all this technology has to offer. Um, in, in the student context, we believe all children should have access to technology and quality STEM education. So through our Verizon Innovative Learning Programs, we've invested heavily to help thousands of Title I middle school students achieve more by providing devices, free internet access, and next generation technology lessons in partnership with Digital Promise. So there's a lot more I can say, but internally and externally, this is how we think about what inclusion looks like at Verizon. Thank you so much. All of it adding a tremendous amount of context. And as usual, I will not be able to get to every question that our audience has shared with us, but I'm going to do my best to try and try and do uh, some combinations. And I know that no one uh, in this uh, on this panel is afraid of a courageous conversation. There's some there's some tough ones coming at us. So um, we're all friends. Throw your hand up when you're ready to take a question, and we'll we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, kind of going back to the visible versus invisible uh, piece that that Sandra mentioned, we have a couple of questions coming in, really about the optics, and maybe maybe even a little bit cynical about do companies really care about doing this work? Why? 
I think, is it important to create a just through society through corporations? And on the flip side, if one were trying to sell their corporation on doing the amazing kind of work that you all are doing, what are the, what are the two or three big arguments that you would give to say, company will do better if we invest this way? Um, well, do you want to take this one first? Kazike? Kazike, go, and then, and then, yeah. we'll, then we'll jump to Sandra. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, I guess, um, you know, when you think about the invisible aspect of, of the work you're talking about and also uh, what's the company's real investment, I think there's a few things that companies are dealing with. One, the, the, their, the employees <laughs> who and investors who are asking them, where do you stand when it comes to these issues? I'm not talking about just the political issues. I'm talking about um, a, a workforce that's increasingly more and more diverse. Uh, when we talk about the investments in STEM and ed education or education in general, it, people are asking companies about their, their, their kind of responsibility to the society because of the strong impact that they have in so many different ways. And so I think, uh, while I think there's a good questions about wh uh, where is a company's you know, investment in this, in this space, I think you're hearing a lot of really great examples of lots of money being involved, but it's more than just the monies and, and the hours that we commit. Uh, it's the qualitative difference of what you see from uh, many leaders across the country who are speaking out actively and personally about why they're doing this work. So it's not just from my perspective, the difference to me is not just going through the motions and checking boxes. It's leadership standing up and speaking personally about why this is important to them. Yes, it is spending dollars, but it's really looking for the strong impact that they want to have on the, and on the community in a meaningful way, not just internally as a community, but externally as well. And so I think when you see those kinds of meaningful changes, that investment, it, we, can, we can look at our calendars or, our, or whatever sheets and say, okay, we did all these things, but qualitatively that we make a meaningful difference in it. And I, one of the things we've talked about in our strategic plan is called a beloved community. And one of the things we talk about are the metrics that we are using to follow the kind of change that we're looking to see over the next 10 years, but also paying attention to the qualitative change that we're looking. So our hearts are changed because, you know, you can do all the right things, right? But in truth, if you're not doing some of the things that many of us have been talking about today and qualitatively change the, the culture of the organization and have an impact on the society that you're a part of, I'm not sure how real change you're going to be actually making. And so I think all the things that we're talking about has to make sure that we, I mean, the reason I say this, and I'll just, I'll end here. You can do all the right things, at least on paper, but still have a racist, sexist, homophobic organization because they're just going through the motions versus one that goes through the motions and qualitatively makes an investment and is responsive to the, the needs of their employees, but also the society as, at large. And so I think that's the, that's the kind of change that I'm looking for when I think about the kind of work that we're doing. Okay, uh, Cheryl, I'm, I'll take a quick stab at it. Um, the, the short answer to the question of do companies really care? I certainly can't speak for every company, but I can speak for Toyota and I can think I can speak for Verizon and NI. I really do think companies care. Uh, but I think as Kaziki said, uh, speaking out and, and demonstrating uh, commitments or things that maybe you are against in the current climate is fraught with a lot of challenge. Um, and, and oftentimes good efforts end up getting turned on its head. And that's why I think companies first and foremost are focused with their team members so that their team members know where it stands and that they are hearing team members um, and that they are speaking on their behalf uh, and moving towards actions to demonstrate that. But I think at the end of the day, every company wants a vibrant, engaged workforce. They want to be an employer of choice. They want to attract the best and brightest. They want to have uh, all of those good perspectives and people around the table. And today that means 
having a culture and an ecosystem that really speaks to a lot of these social justice issues. I think the second part of it, though, is, is that in order to produce the innovative products of tomorrow, I think about the automotive industry with, with flying mobility and driverless cars, all of that and cars that talk to each other, you're going to have to have the best and brightest around the table. And I think companies fundamentally know that in order to do that, they have got to create a culture and an atmosphere that's diverse and inclusive. So, uh, you know, I, I guess as I've kind of watched and participated in the last two years, the thing that really makes me sad is, is I know that there are companies that are out there trying to do the right thing, but then their efforts get misconstrued and twisted and turned around, and, and, and that wasn't the intent at all. But that's why I say companies do best when they can fulfill what their North Star is and what their cultural priorities are, and that team members can connect up to that. So that's, yeah, I think companies absolutely do care. Do they always use the right strategies to demonstrate that caring? Maybe not. But it, it, I wish we lived in a society where we could afford each other more grace, where we could afford each other more of a listening ear and, and let people speak as opposed to trying to tear them down because maybe they're on the wrong side of it. That's, I know we can't solve that today, Cheryl, but if we could, you know, if we could have love being the cover of all of this, I think we'd be in a better place as a society, but I'm sorry, that's my, very much my personal opinion. And if I could add, I, I love what, uh, what both of you have said and, and similar themes, like when we can keep our employees engaged, I mean, I personally have never felt prouder and more energized by the commitments that Verizon has made to society. I mean, people, employees are looking for meaningful work, not just how much do you get paid, it's meaningful work and ways to give back. And the Citizen Verizon Responsible Business Framework takes that into account. Verizon has over 130,000 employees. So the span and breadth of our connections into communities means that when we have social injustice out there, it impacts us in here. It impacts our employees, it impacts our families. It impacts how you show up that day. And whether you're giving 100%, if you got pulled over illegally and searched on the way to work, how are you feeling? Or your son calls you because he was accosted, how are you feeling when you're dealing with a customer, right? So they say happy employees make happy customers. It shows up in how, you know, when our employees are get engaged, it makes a difference in how we show up with excellence to our over 100 million customer connections, right? So there's the connection between our employees being happy means we can deliver excellence and, and deliver our best to our customers. When we provide STEM technology education to students, those students are our future employees. Certainly we hope our future customers, but the future innovators who will contribute to the great technological innovation that our networks will enable. We want them to learn, you know, grow up with the technology so that they can come and really fuel those innovations of the future um, that Verizon is building the network to enable. So our future success is intrinsically tied to the engagement of our employees, the excellence that engaged employees allows us to, to deliver to our customers and from our breath and the way we are interwoven into society. There's really no disconnecting the two. Can I just add one more thing, Cheryl, because I think uh, both of them make some really good points. I also want to acknowledge that I think we're, we're I don't want to say reacting, but we're coming out of a, a generation where business typically did not get involved with these types of activities that we're talking about. It was like, you know, what, what happens at home should not affect what you do at work. And this coming generation, the current generation is saying that's not realistic and never really was. And so I think a lot of what we're talking about and then what we're dealing with is a residual of a society that expected a different uh, expectations of business. Whereas today, there, is, there isn't much difference between, I mean, not difference, but there is 
there's a lot of understanding of how what happens in society impacts the business. And so understanding and respecting that means being doing the very things that I, I hear Nia and, and Sandra talking about is really being attentive to those that, that dynamic that's going on. And I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that little, little deep. I thank you, Kazike, for, for tying those pieces together because you couldn't have brought us to an ending in a better way. Um, I'm a little scared about Sandra's flying cars. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own that one. Um, but I am so thrilled to know that you all are leading in the space that is going to help the world that we're creating. Um, you know, that generation, Kazika, you were talking about, also grew up with sticks and stones will break my bones and words will never hurt me. And words matter. Leadership matters. What people say and what they do. Actions speak louder than words, but words really matter. And I just, I cannot be more appreciative for bringing your lived experience, choosing your words so eloquently today to describe what matters to you, what matters to the corporations that you serve and to the teams that you lead. Um, I am I'm just so honored, such a privilege to be in conversation. And Nia, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the Verizon version of partnership to be able to really go out and be deep in the grass, in the weeds, working on this work with each one of you and your organizations, how you partner with ADL and your communities is absolutely tremendous. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for fighting hate for good. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you for all that ADL does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. This concludes our program. Have a wonderful day.